So my husband is jealous because he loves a hoodie, right? So he loves a hoodie. Ah. And so he's always like this in his hoodies. Like when we travel and he's on the plane, he's trying to sleep, he's got the hoodie. I'm like, you look like the Unabomber. He's like, stop saying that. Do not say that out loud. He's like, I'm a Jedi warrior. And I'm like, there you go. I so, like that. So last night I'm like, look, I'm a Unabomber. I'm like, you're just jealous because I have a hoodie. I'm a Unabomber. He was like, no, we're Jedis. I'm like, okay. I like that. I think Jedis is a good choice. <laughs> there needs to be more female Jedis. Exactly. All right. Let's do this thing. The show started, but let's start the show officially, sort of. I don't know if anybody cares about my Jedi stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. I'm Gina Tremarco, Master Sales Trainer and Director of Coaching at Sales Gravy, and a renegade. Bet you want to know what that means. Ping me and ask me. I just thought I would say it because I'm wearing my renegade hoodie. Back in the saddle is recovering co-host Rachel Pitts. I gotta have a designation because there's the recovering co-host Rachel and the fractional co-host Jeff who is not here. So we have Rachel in the house. Welcome back. It's so good to see you live if you know what I mean. Thank you. Right? Yeah, exactly. I do. I'm super happy to be here in my newest evolution. I was thinking last night before I went to bed that I've been so many things within women your mother warns you about and yes you have you know, and even I, before then yeah i and i've been so many things and s- some people might look at that as the f- as wandering or like a, a flaw i look at it as it's just part of my journey and i am so lit the fuck up by what i'm working on and how i'm evolving right now that I'm, I feel like every, I definitely, you know how we say, you can say things and you don't really embody them. You say that everything that you've learned leads you up to where you are now. I definitely believe that everything that I have learned and experienced was a necessary part of leading me to where I am right now. And I'm just so excited. It's a wonderful thing to be so excited every day when I get up and I can't wait to get into my studies and my material and talk to people about what I'm into. And I I embody it. I live it. I practice it. I write about it. I talk about it. And it's, I just am so excited about this next phase of my life. And when I turned 47 this year, there was this real turning point for me where I realized that I might live 47 more years if I'm lucky, (laughs) because then it doesn't even make me super duper old in today's world. And like in the 47 years leading up to now, I've learned some things, but I've got the opportunity to learn like a whole bunch more things because I now know how much there is to learn. And like, to be honest, kind of like in my 20s and 30s, I didn't really want to learn anything. I was just busy like partying and doing whatever and trying to figure it out. Right. Yeah. And now like I literally have read 37 books this year so far. (laughs) God. And that includes audiobooks that I listen to. Yeah. Yeah. But like. Just learning and growing and expanding and and revisiting all the things, especially a lot of the things Gina has taught me, <laughs> has been helpful. <laughs> and what building have a I new taught? business. What have well, I just building you? a new business. And there's so many things like, oh, by the way, this- I hope you don't mind in my Marco Polos. I'm like, okay, here's the next thing you need to be. I'm like, oh, God, I just. No, I love coaching. it. I'm like, I just went into coaching mode. I love, I accept your coaching and I will be coming to you for more coaching. So please hit (laughs) me with the coaching because I really want to do this right this time. And I have the opportunity in my life to go slowly into this new process, which if you are curious, is I am shifting into being a human optimization coach, which is a space where I help High performers, athletes, high performing salespeople find that extra competitive edge that they really are seeking. And I use certain modalities, including breathwork and mental management, which we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is this. So think about it this way. Let's say high performing salespeople and high performers of all sorts, they're always thinking about optimizing every part of their life. Like, we know that the highest performing CEOs and salespeople in the world 
they exercise, they take care of their nutrition, they're trying to get better sleep, all the things. So they're if they're really high performers like myself, I track everything. How often do you really think about breathing? Because think about this. You can go like actually a pretty decently long time without food and you can go a couple of good long days without water and make it. How long can you really go without breathing? Yeah, not Not long. too long. Now, what's interesting, actually at the airport on Sunday coming back from a trip Felix and I were on, there was the EMT guys were had a little booth. It was like EMT awareness day or something. And I walked up to them and I'm like, guys, I need some information. And they're like, yes, that's what we're here for. And I'm like, I'm already CPR certified. I need to know where you got that Starbucks. Like, where is it in the airport? (laughs) And they were laughing. But I started talking with the, like the leader, I guess he was, I don't know. He was the the most mature of them. There were some hot ones too. EMT guys are hot and efficient. Yeah. So I started talking to him and I was like, yeah, they got rid of the breaths, didn't they, in CPR? Because it used to be like two breaths yeah. and then 30 pumps, whatever. Well, they've gotten rid of the breaths for the most part in in CPR. And the reason for that was so interesting because I'm so into this right now. And he's like, well, the reason is because your blood, unless you're in very poor health and something's wrong, your blood always maintains an oxygen level of between 95 and 99 percent. So when you're doing CPR, if you're not breathing you're not actually expelling any of that oxygen. So the CPR compressions are just moving that oxygen around. You you need your heart to be pumping more than you need Mm, oxygen to be coming in because you should be oxygenated enough to go for a pretty long time. Like until you get below like 85%, you're okay. So I found that really interesting. That makes total sense because because our blood carries oxygen. Right. And I know this well being an anemic. Yeah. So what's interesting in the space of breathing, let's talk about like exercise. So when you exercise, let's say, Gina, you were to go out. I know you're not currently marathon training, but let's say today is the day you start training for a marathon or anybody out there. You're like, haven't ran in a while and you go outside and you start, you're like, I'm going to run from from here to the next mailbox, right? Like Zig Ziglar. What happens usually? What's the first thing that usually happens? When I run from here to the mailbox? Yeah. The whole time I'm like, just get to the mailbox. (laughs) Well, do you get out of breath? (laughs) If I haven't run in a long time? Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that breathlessness, what's your, what is your normal response? What are you going to do when you get to that mailbox? Bend over. Ooh, good job. That was actually a good answer. uh, That was a good answer. I just had a visualization (laughs) of like, oh yeah. So that's actually good because when you the re, when you bend over, you actually give your diaphragm a little bit of an extra. Like, yeah, I didn't even I didn't know that. I didn't know They're that. Very just, good. That was my instinctual move. Yeah. When you bend over, actually, your diaphragm doesn't have to do any extra work to support your posture. So then it's actually a good way to get breath. Yeah. So <laughs> what people normally do when they get out of breath is they try to take big, deep breaths because they feel like they can't breathe. Right. Yeah. What that breathlessness really actually is a lack of tolerance to carbon dioxide. So when we're in like eighth grade science, they teach you, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Mm-hmm. It's like a waste gas. It's actually very not true. Carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is the key variable for helping your red blood cell, red blood cells transfer the oxygen that's already in your blood to your muscles and your organs to do work. So when you get breathless, it's just you can't, you're, to, you're, you're offloading too much CO2 and you can't tolerate it. So training your breath helps you to tolerate the CO2 a little better. And then you become more efficient because the CO2 helps the oxygen get to your, blood, your body more efficiently. So super interesting. And I just, I love that the athletic aspect of breathing but there's so, so much more to it. Well, and the athletic part too goes like all of this really starts to fit together of everything that we talk about. Like the, co- you know, coaching, if you have an athletic kind of mindset, I don't know if that's the right thing to say. Like I coach a lot of people who were college athletes 
It's the winner's mindset, really. Yeah, there it is. It's a winner's mindset. And they are accustomed to coaching, to being coached in a sport and now being coached in their profession. And then that the whole oxygen thing plays such a part in that all of this is really intertwined, which I find fascinating. And as we, I don't know if people know this, Rachel and I, Marco Polo, each other a lot. It's like how we talk to each other. It's funny too, because sometimes we Marco Polo each other and we're like both live watching each other, but we're actually not live talking to each other. (laughs) But we have these conversations that lead to like ideas of like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this, about how breath work plays a part in sales and how we can be higher performers in sales. But on top of that, You got me into this, you sent me this movie to watch about trauma because it was something that came up in the work that you're doing with Breathwork. Just trying to lay the groundwork for our listeners of where we're going with this show. Because Rachel and I, like, we go back and forth with in these Marco Polos, like, oh, this is such a good idea. And this is such a good idea. And it all starts to, like, come together. So, you know, where we're going to go in the journey today is, you know, this new thing world, this new, what's the word, transition that Rachel is making going in to breath work and how, you know, I love that you set this up with talking about you've been many things and here you are. And I think it's important because to, to really emphasize this for anybody out there who's been many things and you're like, sometimes you could start to feel like, when am I going to get it right? Like, I'm going to try this and then I'm going to try this. And I keep trying these things. And we start to create this, our own imposter syndrome through that process. Here's the beauty of being in your 40s and 50s, especially. You've tried a lot of things, which means you've learned a lot of things. And now you've just had, you have all of this knowledge. And then eventually it all comes together and feels like you've arrived. It's sort of like, in my opinion, going from Grogu to Yoda, Right. Who's now Grogu? That... What? <laughs> I don't know who that is. No. That might be a whole other discussion. Is baby that... Yoda. Baby... Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. See, I, I didn't I've... know he had a real name. Well, well, Grogu is different from Yoda, but Grogu. Okay, this is a whole Star Wars thing. Okay, make it snappy because yes, we got more yeah, important exactly. to try. Oh. Just go watch The Mandalorian. I'll okay. just leave it at that. Go okay. watch The Mandalorian and it will make sense to you. I'm obsessed with Grogu. So the point is that we get to a point in our lives where we start to master all of these things and then it all starts to make sense. So, well, just to, to, to play off there. of that, I want to just point this out. So my first career was in dance. Then I was in real estate. Then I was in mortgage. Then I had my dance school. And then I my dark period where I figured all this stuff out and then I evolved into this. I loved my dance career and I had a great dance career and I was super successful in real estate and I was also successful in mortgage and the dance studio. I loved it until I didn't. The thing of that, the common thread through all of that is I never felt good enough in those spaces. I always felt like I needed to be something more, Mm -hmm. always felt a little less than. And don't get me wrong, I learned incredible amounts of different skills in those those places of my career. Right now, I feel so excited about my pathway. I feel it's, and it's not about me at all. Like for me, it's like, oh my gosh, can I please tell you about this information? I want to help you. This is going to help you so much. And it's not about me anymore at all. Like it's about me in that I know I have what it takes to help people get what they're seeking. They are seeking all around themselves and they don't, they know they want this. They just don't know what it is. It just doesn't feel quite right. They're, you're a high achiever. You just want more. You believe in what you're doing and you love what you're doing. You just feel a little bit held back. And this is the work that I have found that I believe that I can truly help people for the rest of my life. I am all in. And I also, all the skills that I've learned up till now are just benefits to me. What I was just communities of people that I can tap into so I can help them because they already know, like, and trust me. Yeah. And I want to rewind for a little bit because that that comment of you, you felt 
you know, you didn't feel fully there. You felt what was the phrase? You felt less than. You didn't feel like you were fully. What was the phrase you used? I've already forgotten. I just didn't feel like I was enough. I, yeah. I felt like I was always a little. I wasn't. I had this ideal of like what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be. And I just never fa- felt like I got there, even though I was there. And now okay, in this. that That's the key there. Right. So we all fall into these moments where we feel like we're not good enough and we're a little bit less than when we actually are good enough and are beyond the less than, but in the moment we don't recognize it. And I think the value in getting experience and learning and aging is that eventually we're like, "Ah, if I could go back and tell my younger self that you did know what you were doing. I think about my entire transition in my career where improv has always been at the foundation of everything. But if I go back 10 years, I didn't think what I was doing was good enough or made sense. And now I was like, man, if I would have just had more faith in myself then. Yeah. Right. That would have been it doesn't matter because I had to go through the things that I've gone through to get where I am to have the confidence that I have today. So I just wanted to give you some affirmation that you were good enough. You just didn't see it and didn't have the confidence in it. And all of that has now led you to where you are. And I've known you for a long time uh, as a coach, as a friend, as a podcast co-host. And I've never seen you more jazzed than I do now. I've never seen you in kind of this calm. You're still like hyped up, but you're more zen and woo than you've ever been. Because you used to be like, like literally a year ago, a year ago, I got married we're shy a couple days, but you were like not in a good place. And you were like a locomotion. Like I was a, sort of afraid in the moment with you mm. because you were just not in the best place. And now like you found this path and you are this just new. You're just in a new place. And I think it's exciting. I'm excited for you. I'm excited because I got some ideas. We're not going to talk about them today on the show, but I'm super jazzed about how the work that you're doing can help high performers. And I also like to us to touch on the trauma stuff that yeah. you turned me on to this movie that literally I'm still having these like aha moments. Oh my gosh. I, I have that shared movie. that with so many people, but we're going to just not tell them what it is yet because yeah. let's start with this. Yeah. So breathing is the only autonomic function in our body that it's automatic. Your body is going to breathe for you when you're not thinking about it. And we also have control over this function. So most people, unless you're a super evolved yogi, that it's you can't just like decide to control your heart rate, right? And yet you can, in a way. Breathing, you can control. So tapping into a lot of the things that I've always been fascinated with Jeb's explanation of the amygdala and the fight or flight response. So I'm not going to go too deep into the science of it. And I'm like the most nerdiest person about the brain science and breathing science right now. But on the simple level, your body is always trying to go into homeostasis, which means balance. When you breathe in, you're going into sympathetic fight or flight. When you breathe out, you're shifting into parasympathetic. So when you are stressed and your amygdala is lit up, you're breathing, generally you're doing a lot more inhale, you're breathe like oh, hyperventilating a little bit and you're panicking and you're, or you're holding your breath, which breath holds have their place, but purposefully being in that sympathetic state does, has all kinds of issues as we know. And you can read about it in any one of Jeb's books where you're in fight or flight, your adrenaline's pumping, all the blood flows out of your brain to your limbs so you can run away from the dinosaur, all this stuff which is was crucial when we were running away from the dinosaur. The problem is that nowadays there's the stress. The stress is so high for everyone, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a high-performing salesperson or an athlete, the levels are so high. You wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, you're already stressed out. If you look too fat or too old or this or that, your teeth are crooked, you need Botox or whatever. Then your phone is going off. There's already 100 emails. 
There's the stress of getting your kids to school on time. There's the stress of being on time. There's the stress of traffic. There's the political unrest. There's all this stuff going on. There's global warming. Like all of it compounds and places most people in that sympathetic stressor all the time. And it's not a good place to be for a lot of reasons, for health reasons. And also just you're, again, if you just think about the very simple fact of the blood flows out of your brain, you're not going to be able to think as clearly and make better, as good of decisions. As good of decisions. I don't know if that's proper grammar, but whatever. The best decisions. There we go. Thank you. So the quickest way to calm yourself down is to extend the exhale. So let's try that just for a second. Just really quick breathing exercise. Everybody place your hand on your chest, right hand on your chest, left hand on your stomach. Left hand on your stomach. There you go. Now, just notice for just a second, where is your breath going? Just notice. This is breath awareness. It's the first thing you want to try to add into your day is just where is the breath going right now? Just by having breath awareness, you're getting out of your mind and you're getting down into your body. Ideally, in order to downregulate and calm yourself down, And to get focused, you want to place your breath down into your belly. That's where your diaphragm is working. And nice long exhale. One more time because I know you need it. Big inhale into your belly. Exhale. So that's a really good place to start is just figure out, just check in with yourself on your breathing. If you're feeling anxiety or panic, just extend the exhale. So you can do, there's the box breathing thing is a really good one for focus. That's a four count breath in, a four count hold, a four count exhale, a four count hold. Box breathing is like your typical easy, Mm -hmm. the Navy SEALs use it all that. Another way is just to extend that exhale. So breathe in for four counts, exhale for eight to 10 counts. That's going to immediately pull you into parasympathetic. I have this really nifty little tool. It's called a Kamosu shift. I, it's the bombest thing ever, especially in traffic, it just kind of extends your exhale. And when I breathe out into it, like I can literally feel my shoulders just like. Explain why it's good in traffic. So in traffic, when I'm getting stressed, I'll just get I'm as you said, I'm a lot more Zen than I have been in life (laughs) unless you're driving slow in the left lane. And then I am not a nice person. So I'll just like exhale and go. (laughs) And just it just slows your breath down. I can give you the link to a little discount code. Oh, yeah. Let's, yeah really let's put really cool. that in the show notes. Um, it's just for me, even though I'm working in breath work, having this around my neck is just a really great reminder that I have a tool that can calm me down instantly, like instantly. It's absolutely I would actually got it more as a conversation piece to like people to go, what is that, a dog whistle? And I can talk about breath work, but I, I have used it. An incredible amount. I think I'm going to need that. So, And you can um, get them in like all colors. It's super cool. Yes. Send me one. And for those listening to this, in case you didn't know that our show is now on YouTube. So you want to go watch it just to see Rachel blow on the whistle. Blow the whistle. Hey, hey. (laughs) So there's the really cool thing. I think probably the coolest thing that about the breath is you can downregulate which is what a lot of us need to calm down and and shift into the parasympathetic. You can also upregulate if you want, if you're getting ready to, if Gina, you're getting ready to present a class, you don't want to downregulate too much because you want to be peppy and energetic. And so there's upregulation techniques as well that you can kind of energize yourself. And really, okay. So yeah, so we can use breath to actually pump us up, not just calm us down. Correct. So what's really cool is I used to, I mean, I'm going to level with you. I used to borderline like abuse pre-workout for my workouts. I don't even use any of it anymore. I hardly drink coffee or caffeine or anything. If I'm feeling low energy, I just stop and do like a five or 10 minute upregulation breath technique. Can you get, it, can you give us an inside peek of that? <laughs> so probably... Let me give you an easy one. Probably the easiest is to, all right, hold on. Let me rewind and then we'll give you this easy upregulation okay. technique. So mostly, and I this is one thing I wanted to mention to you about your sleep study you did last night. 
most of the time, I still got the scars on my face. No. <laughs> most of the time, in fact, all of the time, unless you're doing an upregulation technique, you want to focus on breathing through your nose. There's some really cool science, like some stuff that'll blow your mind in a book called Breath by James Nestor. And he talks about some studies that have been done like on Native American tribes. They will pinch the mouths of their babies shut to train them to breathe through their nose because they believe that mouth breathing is evil. There's a ton of science behind mouth breathing causing all kinds of problems, including like messing up your teeth. It's crazy. It'll absolutely knock you out. This is like stuff that got me into this. Is this why we hear like the phrase about he's a mouth breather? Mouth. Yeah. Well, mouth. I have actually a whole video about mouth breathing on my Instagram. Mouth breather is if you look up the urban dictionary definition, it says like somebody that is not intelligent enough to learn to breathe through their nose. So fascinating. There's (laughs) some cool science behind the reasons that we started mouth breathing. A lot of it has to do with we used to in prior evolution have larger nasal nasal cavities and you can look at the evolution of the human skull once our brain got bigger and dominated the head space our nasal passages shrunk our nose extended our jaw extended like you can look back and see more flattened nose and these bigger nasal cavities like it's huh. i can go on forever about how cool it is so long story short when you breathe in through your nose the nose is a filter It's like all these little hairs and bits. It's filtering the air. It's slowing down the breath. And you're also gaining about 50% more nitric oxide into your body, which nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It opens up the blood vessels for better circulation. So when you're breathing through your mouth, you can get in more air, but you're running into just all kinds of problems. Just trust me on this. Like there's ADHD in children who are mouth breathers, like there's just crazy science about this. So just trust me on this. 99% of the time you want to try to breathe through your nose when you're sleeping. And we talked about this. So I read about mouth taping. (laughs) This is the weirdest thing. And that said, I tape my mouth shut every night and every night right now for the last. And don't tell my husband this. (laughs) So (laughs) what that is, when you're sleeping, you get more nitric oxide. When you're breathing through your mouth, and I'm just putting this out there because you're doing a sleep study. When you're not getting the when you're breathing through your nose and there's enough nitric oxide and all the things are balanced for sleep, your body is meant to sleep for eight solid hours and not get up to pee 10 times and wake yourself up because you're snoring. Snoring is a good indication that you're probably breathing through your mouth while you sleep and sleep apnea when you wake yourself up. When there's more nitric oxide, it's doing all the things it like calms your bladder so you don't have to pee. It helps you sleep through the night. Better diet, better blood flow, all the things. You sleep better. I absolutely have had a huge, enormous increase in the quality of my sleep since I started mouth taping. Now, I was terrified the first couple of nights and I just put, you can start out and just put a little piece of tape. You can get like three millimeter tape. You don't want it to be like duct tape. <laughs> three millimeter tape i actually use kt tape and i kind of like stick get some of the sticky off before i put it on and i've actually graduated to i tape my whole mouth because i was cheating and like breathing through the side but at first you can just tape the middle okay what does your husband say to this when you go to bed with your mouth tape shut well i usually just hold my tape in my hand until he's done talking to me and then i just <laughs> tape it shut but i do snore less interestingly enough he snores less just by me talking to him about it, like funnily enough, because he's a pretty bad snorer and he's not going to mouth tape. But I have noticed because he's a great sleeper. He falls asleep right away. But when I the more I talk about it, I think it's like subconsciously going in that he I just listen and I can tell he's breathing through his nose. Mm-hmm. Anyways, nose breathing is important. All that said. When you want to upregulate you may want to shift to mouth breathing. Now you can do this with nasal breathing, but a lot of the activation, especially in the transformational breathwork journeys, like holotropic breathing, euphoric breathing, which I'll get into in a minute, you want to breathe through your mouth. You can get more air in this way, plus it's going to activate you. So really simple way to upregulate would be 25 deep belly breaths. And literally that is just as deep as you can go into your belly, but place your hands on your belly and really deep breaths into the belly. Very important aspect is to think about breathing horizontally. 
So when we, every time you hear somebody how do you, how do you, eating, so how do you hold on, I'll, I'll explain. That? So what, whenever we think of breathing in, and even I did it before, like we think of this and you breathe up and down with it. your shoulders really should not be involved in breathing. There's like 10 pounds of breathing muscles in your body, but the main muscles are your diaphragm. The diaphragm does move up and down, but it actually moves down when you breathe in to create more space in your airways. And when you exhale, it moves up. So there's that. You want to breathe into your belly and not into your shoulders. But also what's happening is when you inhale, it your ribs, your intercostal muscles of your ribs are expanding this way. Your lungs are increasing capacity when you breathe in. And then they're coming together when you breathe out. Doesn't that make more sense than up and down? Mm -hmm. So you want, you have to kind of think about this. Try to like just really relax the shoulders and think almost breathe into your back. So you're breathing horizontally. It's kind of more a mind body connection thing that you'll figure out when you think about it. But just remember that I remember horizontal breathing so that you stay out of your shoulders because when you're breathing up and down in your shoulders, you're generally chest breathing rather than expanding. So the diaphragm moves down, everything expands, diaphragm moves down, ribs move out. And really the exchange of air in your lungs is just like a shift in the external pressure of the air and the internal pressure of your lungs and that change of atmosphere and pressure. So 25 deep belly breaths, kind of rapid, just like 25 will activate you, super activate you. And are you breathing out of your mouth or out of your nose? To Exhaling do, out. So up regulation, generally in and out through the mouth. You can go in through your nose and out through your mouth. That works. Okay. It sort of depends. For some people, especially anybody that has high blood pressure, you might want to stay away from too much upregulation and you might want to breathe through your nose just so well, you're not that, going that's too fast. An interesting point. I know that there, there are people that they've got, what is, I don't know if it's called like white coat, high blood pressure. You know, they go get their blood pressure and then like they're high. Their blood pressure is high at the doctor's office, but they're not normally high. And I did have a nurse say to me, because like it was super high when she did it. She's like, all right, we're going to do it again. And this mm -hmm. time I want you to breathe in and out slowly through your yep. nose. And literally it brought my blood pressure down. I was like, dang. So mm -hmm. now I do that every time I go to the doctor. Yep. Is I just go into that breathing as I take my blood pressure. And lo and behold, it's yep. normal. Yeah, definitely. Been there, done that. Last week, my blood pressure was super high when I went to the doctor and he was like, I was like, I'm a little stressed out. <laughs> Another one that's really cool is the 10, 10, 20, 30. So you want to take 10 deep breaths in. You can do it through your nose. You can do it through your mouth. Just 10 deep breaths, kind of nice and deep, and then hold for 10 seconds. So inhale and hold, right? Let me just find my notes to make sure I'm giving you the exact because I'm so like amped right now. <laughs> I want to make sure that I give you all the proper on the 10, 20, 30, because the 10, 20, 30 is really cool because it also employs a breath hold, which increases that tolerance for CO2, which we want. So you want to breathe 10, 10 breaths and then inhale and on your inhale, hold for 10 seconds. So 10 deep breaths, hold for 10 seconds on your inhale, then exhale, then go to 20 deep breaths, hold for 20 seconds on your inhale. And then you can go to 30. You can go all the way up to 60. But what the way I usually will do it is I'll do the 10 deep breaths, hold for 10, 20 deep breaths, hold for 20, 30 deep breaths, and then I'll hold up to 60 seconds. Now, what you will notice, and this has been a really cool outcome for me too that I've done like a, I do breathing practice pretty often because I'm studying right when you start doing these deeper breaths you'll find that your breath hold time increases because you're oxygenating yourself and then you're also calm and then you can hold your breath longer I think that my longest breath hold so far has been like three and a half minutes and when I did that, I was like, what the F? Holy, like, 
If, if you'd have told me a year ago that I would be able to hold my breath ever for three and a half minutes, I'd be like, no. But the truth is, when you're unloading enough oxygen, your body's like, cool, as long as you're just chill. But the main thing about activation techniques is it takes you out of your head for a minute and gets you in your body and gets that blood kind of flowing. Then there's also balancing breaths. So there's down regulation, up regulation, balancing. The balancing stuff is something you might want to do before you go into an intense period of studying, before you go into a presentation where you want to be calm and focused, just something where you need to get balanced. You might want to do it. You might either want to upregulate before a sales call block, or you might want to balance so you're not too jacked up. It just depends on how you know, know thyself, right? So the balancing techniques. The balancing include, could be during your actual sales presentation. Right. So you'll notice sometimes when you see a really effective speaker who's commanding the stage, generally they take some pauses and they're just comfortable in the pause. And you can do that too, just with an exhale. And one thing they teach in Toastmasters is if you're a like, you know, kind of person, just substitute a pause and a breath. The audience doesn't even notice. They just, it gives them time to process. It's interesting because we teach that in improv, the silence part. The audience actually leans in. If mm -hmm. you just stop talking and just stand there, all of a sudden you've gained the focus of the audience by doing literally nothing. Yeah. I think I've always said that nothing is the hardest thing you can do on stage and the most effective. So let's talk about how can we use this as high performers? How can we... What are your thoughts on that from a sales performance perspective? From sales performance perspective, you want to figure out what you need in the moment. So do you need to downregulate because you're something just happened that caused you so much stress and anxiety that you know that this is going to come across the phone, across the table to the prospect you're speaking to? Sometimes you need to downregulate. Sometimes you need to upregulate to get yourself jacked up and motivated if you're having kind of a down lull in your day and you know you have a sales call block you need to take care of. Sometimes you need to just balance to feel more focused and get back to your center of what you need to be doing. The key is to remember that there's this thing called co-regulation that we do with people. And a really great, and I didn't get to it because we shifted gears, but the best thing you can do for co-regulation is resonant breath. And it's just a slow five count breath in through the nose, a slow five count breath out through the nose or mouth. This, and you can look up heartmath.org if you want to like really have your brain melt. There's what some, is it? Heart math. Heartmath.org. So these guys are like mega scientists that studied co-regulation of people like you walk in a room sometimes or let's say someone else walks into a room and you're like Ugh, their vibes are totally not mm. good, right so there's this crazy interesting science that your brain actually puts out a magnetic field of only a few inches around your head your heart puts out and this is not your aura it's not woo this is measurable science your heart puts out a magnetic field of about three feet around you that can affect others. Measured by science. Check out the hard math guys. They're like neuroscientists, you know, neuroscientists, brain scientists. They're super crazy. It's so good. So wit and people can feel it across the phone. You know, when you're like talking to somebody and they're saying one thing and you're getting just an div another vibe and you're like, it just doesn't seem to. Yeah, something's add off. Up. Something's off. Generally, it's some kind of underlying stress. They're not, it's probably linked to some kind, who knows, trauma or something that happened earlier in the day. It's, this is the stuff that you can begin to control and regulate a little bit better with your breath. It's a conscious thing you do. You don't have to take a pill. You don't have to do anything. Just sit and be still and breathe. I've actually been doing this right now. My, my teenage daughter is going through some very stressful stuff. And sometimes when I'm with them, I just will do resonant breath to co to try to co-regulate them. So I'm not saying anything to them. 
I'm not doing anything. I'm just with them. And I am calming my breath. And in turn, I can see the result that it's calming them down. It's a subtle thing. It's a conscious thing. And it does work. So that's something for you to consider when you're sitting across the table or even when you're on the phone with a prospect. Consciously, while you're listening, it'll help you listen. Try to co-regulate with them. It's kind of like what you teach in sales training, like mirroring somebody and, you know, really dialing into them. You can also co-regulate with them and they're not even going to really know. They're just going to suddenly feel really connected with you because you're co-regulating with this person. It's a strong technique that we use in various aspects of breathwork, especially if like somebody is in a breathwork journey and they're having a really emotional experience and it's they're panicking. You can co-regulate them down just by being and using your breath to co-regulate. It's really fascinating. It's like about as woo as I've ever gotten in my <laughs> life. But, you know, when I get when somebody comes along with some measurable scientific facts about it, it makes sense. So when you here's a really ah, crazy. <laughs> so when you do resonant breathing for five minutes or so, you get yourself into let me make sure I get the hertz right. There's a, a number that you get to where you're vibrating at, I think it's 0.01 hertz, which is the same vibration that the Earth's magnetic field is vibrating in. So like, you're like in tune with the Earth, so woo, right? <laughs> Pretty sure it's 0 <laughs> 0.1 hertz, but you can feel it. What it does is it puts you into homeostasis where you're like in balance, you know? I can't even find it in my notes, but it, I'm pretty sure it's 0 0.1 hertz. You can look it up. Look up resonant breathing, co-regulation, all that stuff in heart math. But it just gets you, there's a place where the human body really wants to be. And you know it. You felt it before. We were just like, ha. you're calm. Everything is working in sync. When you're in that coherent breathing, all of the systems of your body are working together rather than working against each other, right? Mm -hmm. So like when you're in sympathetic, you're, you're like, this is when you feel kind of like nauseated because you're just like, ah, your body is not working on digesting right now. Your body is working on running away. When you get into co to coherence, then everything is working properly. So I think all of us can agree when you're jamming, like when you're in a call block and like things are going well and you're like in the flow, you're almost not trying and you can feel it that yeah. you're just like, I know there's been times when, Gina, you've told me you did a presentation for a group and everything was just perfect and everybody was in it and you were flowing and it doesn't feel, it feels effortless. Yeah, yeah. And everything and, and, feels right. And then you and feel a, so good. It's a high. And, and you it's have a high. A, yeah. You have a, you're like, gosh, I feel like I just hit, took a hit and I don't do Here's drugs. Here's the thing. <laughs> it's not actually a high. It's actually where our body wants to be. And mm -hmm. all the time we're floating in and out of that and mostly away from it, especially in today's stressful world. Yeah. There's nothing so, like that euphoric feeling. What is really also cool about breathing is... So shifting into the transformational breathwork journeys that I'm being trained for. And the first time I did one of these was last year, randomly, can't even remember how I fell into it, but it was right after I closed my dance studio and I was going through all of this emotion and just fear and worry and all this stuff. And I did this breathwork journey and I was like, holy crap, I, it's sort of indescribable what happens in these breathwork journeys because it's different for everybody. What happens is you actually are doing mouth breathing, which is counterintuitive to what I've said. I understand. But what you're doing is you are breathing so much and so deeply for about 45 minutes. It shifts you into transient hypofrontality in your brain. So what it is, it kind of, long story short, it shifts you out of that monkey mind. So when you begin these types of journeys, you're like, this is stupid. I have to pee. I can't do this. Why am I doing this? This isn't, why, why did I just, like your brain does all these things. After a while, you shift out, you shift in that transient hyperfrontality and you go into kind of a theta brain state, which is basically tapping into your subconscious. 
your brain, what we walk around with on a daily basis is only about 5% of our brain power. 95% of your brain power is the subconscious. And a lot of us, this is where we shift into this trauma thing. Almost all of us have experienced some sort of trauma in our life. Now, it may not be a situation of physical, emotional, sexual abuse or a, like a natural disaster. It may or may not have been that. It may have been something that happened in, in your family life from mild to extreme emotional. Like, like getting locked in your bedroom as a child. Like getting locked in your bedroom as a child or... You might just be someone whose parents were emotionally unavailable and you tried so hard to get their attention and you didn't get it. So there's a lot of ways that people can experience trauma. Highly recommend, and we can put this link in the show notes. It's a documentary called The Wisdom of Trauma. We'll put it in the show notes, but you can just Google it and you'll find the wisdom of trauma.com, I believe it is. It's a documentary by Gabor Mate about trauma and how it manifests itself in our body and our subconscious, and it wreaks havoc. It causes all these triggers, emotional triggers, limiting beliefs, physical and medical issues, but really, especially for high performers. This is the piece that I find really fascinating for athletes, high performers. Sometimes you're just, you're amazing at what you do, and yet you know. And your coaches and your boss and your coworkers or whatever, your client, know that you're there's something holding you back or you have something that triggers you and then you just self-sabotage or you give up too soon just when you're on the cusp of greatness. And a lot, sometimes that has to do with some of this trauma that we don't even realize. And the reason for this is because we stuff it down. So going back to the breathing and how your body regulates, there's this thing called polyvagal theory. I also have a video on it and there's just go look up polyvagal theory. It talks about how the body processes stress. It used to be before this Dr. Stephen Porges came up with polyvagal theory that we were like, oh, I'm either stressed or I'm not stressed. Those were the states. Dr. Porges figured out that there's more than one state of stress. There's the, I have to think of the scientific terms. Let me not use the scientific terms because I'll get them wrong. There's the state where you're happy and you're empathetic and you're able to talk to people and you're socially interacting and you're cool, right? There's that state. We like that state. Then there's the sympathetic activation state where you are in fight or flight and you're like, ah, we know that one. The third situation is called dorsal vagal shutdown. That one I'll get right. What this is, this is what happens when things get so stressful that your body's like, nope, this is all we can take. That's our max. We're putting a cap on it. And then you shut down. This is what children do when they don't know what to do. Whether it's you're like, dad, look at the picture I drew. And dad is doesn't pay any attention and goes behind his newspaper. Whether it's your mom locks you in the bedroom. Whether it's your parent is beating you. Whatever that it is, for the most part, it's too much for a kid to handle and sometimes for adults. I was just going to say, down. this is what it, we're yeah. getting into. This goes into adulthood because you didn't learn how to deal with it as a child. Right. And it's a protection mechanism because the body just can't handle that kind of stress and the mind. And sometimes it's just like you don't know how to process it. And we do this. We have something really huge happen and we just can't deal with it and we stuff it. And what happens is that cap is on there and it's it's holding this together, but you don't just suddenly get move from dorsal vagal shutdown through parasympathetic activation into, I forget, it's ventral vagal something, can't remember, into like, hey, I'm happy, I'm good. It's usually like a blow up. So when we stuff all this stuff down, it's not that it goes away. Trauma latches itself into the body and stays there. And it repeats and repeats. So like example, you know, one of my childhood traumas was being told I was fat at a young age. And it still triggers me through so much work. I'm so much better at it. But that is like the if you come up to me and go, wow, you look fat today. I will t completely melt down probably because that is one of my childhood traumas. And 
a lot of time, the, and the thing about trauma that Gabor Mate talks about in his documentary and his work, you're, when we're responding to triggers for our trauma, we're not actually responding to what's happening right now. We're responding to what happened to us back then. And trauma is not actually what happened. It's what happens within the body as a result of what happened. So he has this great line. It's a child. It's not what happens to the child that causes trauma. It's when the child is left alone with that hurt. Yeah. That was my biggest takeaway from that. It is the fact that you are alone in it. Yeah. And so that's one powerful part about the somatic healing of breath work is like example, you can go to therapy for years and talk about what happened to you. Sometimes you don't even really remember what happened to you or realize because you've stuffed it down so deep. And Gina and I have been talking a lot about this and both of us have been like, I didn't even think about this for, I've never told anybody that. So oh yeah, like, I like, I left you in. like videos last night of like stories that I've never told another person yeah. that I never realized was so deep down. Yeah, we're digging into the subconscious now and like unlocking these doors. So the, and in breath work, you actually, it's really interesting because you'll never know what comes up. Like there's been really interesting things that come up for me. When you go into this theta brain state and you're in the subconscious, you're sort of just like opening these doors that you've never that you haven't looked in ever or in a long time. And you're able to actually begin to process some of it. Now, it's not a magic pill. Some people, it takes a few sessions to become comfortable with what they're doing or to really lean into it because you have to feel it to heal it. And a lot of what happens is with trauma and past traumatic experiences, we're afraid to feel it. We stuff it so we don't have to feel it because it's too painful to really face. And all we're doing, all we're doing is avoiding, avoiding going away and it it manifests and we're not going to get to it in this episode. So I think this will be part two. We'll move (laughs) into trauma in, in another episode. So we'll get that scheduled. So I'll ping you on that. We'll move into the trauma, but real fast before we wrap up talking about trauma, I just pulled some really great articles on trauma and and trauma in the workplace. And you and I have had this conversation Mm -hmm. too about, it's not really Mm -hmm. a trauma that happens at work, but it's something that triggered you that, you know, you're going back to something that happened before. I'm such a big believer in this. I've talked to you about it before. One of the books I'm writing on how to be more childlike in sales, like there's a whole section on what happened to you in your childhood and how that does impact how you perform in sales or in your work. I think there's a major correlation on this and I haven't seen a lot written on it, but I do believe it. But one of the articles I pulled says, trauma can be expressed on the job as absenteeism, increased distraction, task avoidance, accidents, loss of motivation, irritability with coworkers, and increased conflict. So I just want to wrap the show with that as this is what we'll tackle in the next show of what does trauma mean? What do triggers mean? The word triggers are used a lot right now. Some people are actually annoyed by that, but I think it's important to give attention to it. So to move into this, you know, even higher performance, how do you just recognize that you had things that affected you that maybe you get triggered by that are actually impeding your success? And then how do you use the modality of breath work to actually, or even improv? And this was like another video I sent you that, you know, the work I do with improv is a modality. It's a tool. Breath work is a tool to help you get to the next level. Because I know that we have to wrap up. Is there anything you want to add to that? And then we'll pick up on the next episode and start talking about trauma and breath work. Yeah. So if you noticed any of those things that Gina mentioned that sounds like you, if there's things that make you lose your cool, especially in a work environment, then you might want to start just looking a little bit into that so that you can help improve your performance. If you are looking for more information about up your regulation, down regulation, balancing techniques, or if you would like to try a transformational breathwork journey, 
reach out to me. I would love to share this work with you and figure out how I can help you on your journey to attack these limiting beliefs and optimize your performance. And real fast, you had mentioned that you had done a breathwork journey back during the whole dance school scenario. How did you how did you end up doing a breathwork journey? Like where did that come from? Like how did this all start? Well, I actually it was a it was an in, I not remember now. It was an Instagram ad about this breathwork journey. And I was like, let me check this out. I don't know what this is. And so I tried it and then it was amazing. And then I came back to it after I had processed a little bit more of my, you know, emotions of the dance studio. And when I came back to it the second time, I literally did this journey that I was saying on the surface that I was believed that this whole scenario with the studio was a good thing and all the things. But I, the truth was I was having nightmares. I was having anxiety about running into people. I was super stressed. And I took one breathwork journey and all of that went away. Like mm. it's gone. I have completely, totally good with talking to any of those people about it and anything about it. It's just one of those modalities that can help you just let go of some stuff. Okay. A lot of what we are doing is via Zoom. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. I can lead you on a breathwork journey and you can do it in the safety of your own home. And it is 100% safe. There is... I'll be, doing, I'll be doing one and I can we can talk about that on another episode. Yep, we should do one before the next episode. <laughs> yeah. And then we can delve deeper into the trauma thing because it's just there's I think there's millions and millions of traumatized people walking around in the world that could have a heightened experience of life in general if they were able to integrate their past trauma into their their journey of their life. Yeah, I think I could be wrong. There's no, I don't think there's any scientific evidence on this, but I think just about everybody has experienced some type of trauma in their life and they either, either dealt with it or not. I know that. Here's a big have, bomb. Everybody was born and there's trauma connected there we, to the birth. There we go. Of every human. Everybody <laughs> has had trauma. And I know that you've talked to your husband about this and I've started to talk to my husband about it. And he's like, I've never had any trauma. I'm like, OK, we will table that for another time. <laughs> Yeah. So. Just use this phrase, <laughs> generational trauma. We'll get into that next time. Too. Yep. Exactly. Awesome. Well, we got to wrap up. Thanks. Thanks for being here to talk about this. I can't wait to dive into the trauma aspect. Again, we will put this in the show notes. Rachel, real quick, how can people reach out to you to start exploring this? I am easy, most easily found on Instagram or Facebook, Ultra Fit Lifestyle, or you can send me an email your ultra fit lifestyle at gmail.com. Okay, great. So reach out to Rachel for that. We'll put stuff in the show notes on it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Women Your Mother Warned You About brought to you by Sales Gravy. And another way to get past some sales trauma in your life is to go up level at Sales Gravy University, where we offer 250 plus courses at this point. Um, at this point of the year, we've added 60 some courses alone this year to our catalog, both on demand and live. Of course, some courses created and taught by me as well. So check that out, salesgravy.university. And you can find the women your mother warned you about all over social media. And we'll see you on the next show. Check us out on YouTube. Bye, everybody. Bye.